G'day everybody, Nick Dingle here again with another C Sharp tutorial. This time we are looking at looping. Okay, so looping code means to repeat statements of code and we've got three different types we're gonna look at. We have a while loop, a do loop, and a for loop. And we're gonna do all three in this video with a couple of examples for each. So to start us off, let's just write our good old faithful write line, hello world, like so. Now, if I, for instance, wanted to repeat this code here, let's say I wanted to print it on the screen 10 times, I could easily enough just copy the line and paste it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. So I've got 10 hello worlds on the screen. How about I want to print this 100 times? Well, I could easily copy that section, paste it 10 times. And you can see this is already going to look very ugly and it's going to be stupid. Why would we do it? I don't know. It's just a quick example. So let's bring it a good old while loop. And before we do it 10 times, let's do it infinite amount of times. So this is a while loop. So you write the while word, keyword that is, all lowercase, and in brackets, just like an if statement, you provide a condition. And so long as, the, as that condition is true, the code block will continue to execute. So for example here, while true, which is always going to be true, we're gonna be writing hello world to the screen a whole lot. So when I press start, You'll see, hello world, it doesn't look like it's doing anything, but watch that scroll bar. You see it scrolling down, that means it's printing as quickly as it possibly can. All right, so this is what you call an infinite loop because we're never gonna be able to get past executing line 16, okay? Because we're stuck inside the loop. Now this is actually what occurs when a program locks up and stops responding in Windows. You've hit an infinite loop and it could be a various number of reasons why we've got stuck in an infinite loop. But let's get out of it. I don't like infinite loops. We want to know how many times our loop is executing. Generally speaking, you call that your stopping condition. So for example, I'm just going to bring in a variable called count. It's going to start at zero for me. And while count is less than 10, we're going to repeat the code in our code block. So for instance, this is our stopping condition. So while it's less than 10, repeat the code. As soon as 10 becomes a value greater or equal to 10, the code block will stop executing and it jumps outside of it. So I'm no longer gonna print hello world, I'm gonna print count, because I want you to see what's happening. All right, and you need to make sure if you're using a counter with a loop, increase the value, okay? So this will increase count by one. So it's going to start at zero, check if it's less than 10, well it is to start with, because it's zero. We print that zero to the screen and then increase zero by one, the count goes to one. And then it jumps up, checks the condition again, one is less than 10, it'll print one, and then increase to two. So it should stop as soon as the value reaches 10. So I'm just gonna put a read key in so we can see the bottom of it. And there we go, zero to nine. So if I wanted to get a larger number to start with, you simply need to change the variable's starting number. And if you want a larger number at the end, you simply need to change the stopping condition. Okay, because as soon as this goes false, that's when we stop. So if I press play, you'll see it stops at 59 now, and so forth. I'll let you play around with that, but let's have a look at another quick example. So I'm gonna drop the counter for the moment, and we're gonna try a different kind of condition because it doesn't have to be just a counter that stops our program. It might be the user. Let's have one number, and let's have another variable called total. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna ask the user continually for numbers, and we're gonna add them all up. So we're gonna total every single number they type in. When they type in a zero or maybe a negative number, we'll stop the loop. So the way this is going to work, I'm just gonna quickly make this equal two, and I'll tell you that in this, well, you could do one, it doesn't really matter. While num uh, is greater than or equal to, uh, just greater than zero, okay? So while it's greater than zero, that's why I said num equals one, because I want this code block to actually happen to start with. I'm going to ask the user, enter a number, okay, like so. Then I'm going to get the number from the user. And we'll just do that with a console.readline. Now, if this confuses you, please look at my user input video. And once we've got the number, we're going to add it to total, like so. Okay, what's it whinging about? Oh, I should probably put an equal zero on the end of that. And it'll stop whinging. Okay, once we've added it up, okay, we can type in as many positive numbers as we want. As soon as we type in a zero or a negative number, it's gonna jump out of this and then we'll print your total is, and I'm just gonna do the old school way of printing it to the screen because my poor students at school have to do it. 
Yeah, press play. 10, 6, whatever. Okay, as soon as I type in a zero, it jumps out of the loop and my total is 199. That's a nice little coincidence. Is that right? Hmm. Data. So there you go. That's a quick little use of the while loop without using a counter. You can let the user actually stop the looping of code. Just something a little bit different for you. Now, this one here, the while loop, is called a pre-test loop. And the reason it's called a pre-test loop is because we check our condition before the code block. So just as most things in this world have opposites, we have pre-test loops and we have what's called post-test loops. And these guys are called do's, like so. And the condition sits at the bottom, like this. So let's just do our counter again. I'll have to recreate it, like so. But as you can see, we've got the do keyword at the top, we've got our code block straight after it, and then our condition sits at the bottom of the code block. All right, and what this means, I'll just quickly, before I explain what it means, let's quickly put, that's not how you spell count, like so. What this means is that our code has to execute at least once before the condition is checked in this do loop. With the while loop, because the condition is checked first, there is the opportunity that our code will never execute. All right. So what you can think of is a pretest loop is zero to infinite amount of times, and the do loop is, or the post test loop is one to an infinite number of times it repeats. Okay. And this is going to behave the exact same as our original while loop there. It's just I've put the condition at the very bottom. All right, so that's the do loop. I don't really want to do much more with him. Let's do the most interesting loop of all, the for loop, okay? He has different names. He can be called a counting loop, an iterative loop. Well, most people are just going to call him the for loop. And he's exactly how he sounds, F-O-R, okay? In the for loop, you need to specify three different things in these brackets. It's no longer just a condition that becomes true or false. The condition is in there though. So I'm going to go int count equals zero, count less than 10, count plus plus. So you can see we've already written those lines of code multiple times before, but now you put it all in the top of the loop. So a for loop is designed to do all the counting for you. So it creates the variable and starts at zero. It'll repeat until we get above or equal to 10. And each time we execute the for loop, increase count by one. Okay, so you call this the variable initialization, the condition, and the stepper, or the step, for that matter. So what we do each step of our loop. All right, so let's quickly do an example. Same example we've done the entire time, but you'll see this time that I drop the count plus plus, and that's because it's already done for me at the top. It does all the work for you. That's what I often say in class, and the kids hate me for it. Anyway, so you can see zero to nine, exact same behavior, but we've got a lot less code in that one little line. It's very easy to control how big the number wants to go, okay, and how small you want to start at. So I haven't done this yet. You can do negative numbers if you really want, and it will go up to the top. If you want to go backwards, for instance, okay, I know I'm going pretty quick here. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, so we're going to go backwards instead of going small to big we're going to go big to small so we start at 20 and we're going to wait we're going to keep executing until we get to zero and we're going to decrease each step and there we go 20 to 1 if i want to include zero by the way just make that an equal to 2 and that will include the number zero and here's one last interesting fact before i show you my last thing is if i wanted to decrease by 2 you can actually change your step to look like this. So every single time it executes my right line, it's going to decrease count by two. Like so, 20, 18, 16, 14, 12, and so forth. Now, I know that I've been focusing on this word count, right? I like count because it's really easy to read. It's very common though, you'll see programs use the letter I, okay, instead of count. And it means the exact same thing, Generally, it's short for integer or index, depending on how it's being used. But you'll often see I being used as opposed to the word count. Now, I prefer the word count because it means a little bit more to people. Now, I'm going to comment this out. One last thing. Let's do an infinite for loop. Like so.
just to round it up. So this is how you do an infinite loop in a for loop. Why would you ever want to do that? Because you can. Okay, one way you can get out of loops before your condition ends, sometimes you want to do this. Let's say I let the user type in a word. So let's go word equals read line. Okay, don't ask me why I'd do this, but I am. And let's say if the word they type in is stop, then what we do is we use what's called a break. Now break is the keyword for jumping outside of a loop. So even before we've hit our ending condition, it will jump out of the code block and keep going with our program. So in my program, I've now set it up so I can type in hello, kudos, and then as soon as I type stop, I've got a read key at the bottom. So I might get rid of this read key quickly. So once again, hello poodles, stop. It stops the for loop, okay? And that's just a quick way of showing you how to do it. Thanks very much for watching everybody. In the next video, we're gonna be having a look at structs and what they are. But you know where like, subscribing and commenting is and please think about doing any one of those things and I'll see you in the next video.